Okay, round of applause for the second half piece. Yay. Thank you so much. Man. Thank you so much. Um, Mick, as you were saying, you're already here. Yeah. Uh, and that is actually correct. Um, if we were to ask ourselves, is the moon here? It's kind of ridiculous to think that the moon isn't here. Just because we can't see it. It's on the other side of the world. And when you think about it, yeah, everything's here. All the Americans are here, they're just a long way away. And you have to pick some distance where you decide that things aren't here. And that means that the sun isn't here. And so everything's here. That's kind of the, the thought that I had in the bar. Is everything's here. And it's all just doing something. And some people argue that if things um, <coughs> are out of your sight, perhaps they don't exist and perhaps they're not doing anything. So, and if there's anyone here who ever thinks that, I can prove to your satisfaction that when things are out of your sight, things do happen and that they have consequences. All I need is your bank card and PIN number. <laughs> and I'll let this be <laughs> <a few> minutes <laughs> <Very good. laughs> the week. You will be convinced. <laughs> <laughs> so, we looked at the past. Let's look at the present. A little bit easier. We say a car does 100 miles an hour. On miles, it's an hour. Uh, so we say that things take time to move. We talked about the past, and that's just one angle. So if, if you're not happy with what I've said about the past, don't worry about it. The present, things take time to move. This is, this is almost like the bedrock of why time exists. Of course, things take time to move. 100 miles an hour. We know cars exist. We know motion exists. We know 100 miles exist. Therefore, hours exist. Everything fits together and it works. That seems pretty convincing. <coughs> But all we actually observe is that the cars is that cars move and that the Earth spins. This is what we start off. If we didn't have a clock, but we had a car, we had an accurate telescope or whatever, we could look at where the sun was, we could see that it moved 15 degrees, we could see that we've done 100 miles, we could calculate that we've done 100 miles in an hour. But all we actually observe is that the car moves and that the Earth spins. Or we get a little motorised motor on our wrist that rotates at the same speed the earth rotates. We're still really comparing it to the earth. But we use the word hours, and suddenly it looks like hours exist. It so happens that if a car travels 100 miles, if it's traveling 100 miles an hour, a point on the equator will move around about 1,000 miles. The equator is actually 25,000 miles around. I measured it last week. Uh, and the earth spins 24 hours. So if you work out a point on the equator when you're sitting there having a martini or whatever, you're doing about a thousand miles an hour. A little bit more. Of course that varies. If you go right up to the North Pole, you're not doing anything at all. I think going like this very slowly. So. <coughs> now the point is this, that the Earth spins 15 degrees in an hour. If you do the maths, that's what it does. It spins 1 24th of a revolution. So the car moves, the Earth spins. We could say that the car travels at one-tenth the speed of a point on the equator. And if we say that, I've given you all the information you need to know about how fast that car is going. Uh, in England, it's illegal to travel beyond uh, 0.7 tenths of the speed of the equator, or whatever. You know, a jet fighter might fly at half the speed of a point on the equator. <clears throat> when you say it that way, you're giving people all the information that they need. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is it's not a semantic difference. It's not just words. Miles per hour suggests that miles and hours exist, which implies that time exists, which implies that time is needed for motion. Things take time. It will take me an hour to get home. Time suggests that the past and the future exist. One of the tricky things with this is that people then think, well, you know, miles kind of do and don't exist because they're just a, a measurement of distance. And seconds kind of do and don't exist because they're a measurement of time. And that's really an unfair comparison. It's true that, in a sense, miles are a vague idea. <clears throat> but if we say that, that seconds are the same as miles, seconds kind of hijack uh, validity, if that makes any sense. What's the difference miles per hour and one-tenth the speed of a point of the equator? One-tenth the speed of a point of the equator just suggests that things can exist. Anyone here who doubts that things can exist? Very much in agreement with that. It suggests that things can move. We all pretty much agree that things can move. It suggests that we can compare the speeds of different things. And that's all it does. And that's all we see. And that undermines the idea that hours exist. You know, this bus is taking ages. Really? Where's it taking ages from? You know? 
So we start by assuming that miles an hour is a good proof that time exists, and we end up saying, oh yeah, but time exists anyway. And that's very unscientific to do that, to change horses and to drop what you were playing with. Another way of looking at this is uh, you say saying Bolt can run uh, 100 metres in 10 seconds, but if you've got a clock, particularly one of those big clocks that they have at the stadiums, you might well find that it's about a centimetre between each of these marks around the, the dial. And what you'd find is that you're comparing the speed and distance that you say Bolt travels with the speed and distance that this bit of plastic travels. You're just comparing two things that are here now and that are moving. And none of them prove that time exists or that it flows or that it's needed for things to happen. This won't work unless you put a battery in it. That won't work unless you put some cornflakes in it. We have energy in us that makes things move and change. The question is, do we have energy and time, or do we just have energy, that things just exist and move and change? So if objects in the world could just exist, move and interact, change, whatever, <coughs> with this explain, what do you attribute to the present? We can discuss that if you like, or... Good. <laughs> <laughs> the future. Finally, the future has arrived. We think that the future constantly arrives. We, we know that tomorrow is going to happen, but we don't know if it's going to rain or not. So the future seems not only to constantly arrive, but it seems to be predictable and unpredictable. It's predictable that tomorrow is going to arrive, unpredictable whether or not it's raining. You'll find that the predictability that, that the sun is going to rise is related directly to the fact that the Earth is very, very heavy and it's spinning. It's very hard to stop it spinning because it's so big and heavy. If it was smaller and lighter, we could change it, stick a couple of rocket engines on Mount Everest and slow the thing down, do whatever you want. But the reliability of, of something relies very much on that. You know, trains are, are very reliable as far as going in a straight line because they're held there by metal rails. Uh, leaves blowing in the air are a very odd shape and they're travelling through turbulent air. Things move, they can move in chaotic ways or orderly ways. If you go down to your local park and you try to see the future arriving, what you will actually see is lots of things moving constantly. You'll see clouds moving and changing constantly. Kids swinging around, swings here, people going up there, rabbits, dogs, kids, whatever, whatever, whatever. <clears throat> you can call that the future arriving if you want, but all you're seeing is things moving. And all those things that move have to have energy within them that's coming out of them. If that squirrel was dead or starved to death, it wouldn't be able to move. There'd still be some motion, but you see what I'm saying. Candle. This candle will burn for five hours. Well, it depends how much wax is in there and how <coughs> quickly the wax is coming out. But if there's no wax in it, it won't work. This car will only run if there's fuel in the tank. If you take the fuel out of the tank, it won't do that. We're seeing something from the inside coming to the outside, and we're calling it the future arriving. And one of the reasons we're calling it the future arriving is because we're convinced that the past exists. And then we're convinced that things take time to move in the present. So then we look for the future. And all of these things, if we assume that time exists, then they seem to be confirmed. But seeming to confirm something is not the same as proving it. If you get a balloon, you blow it up and you let it go, you might find that it flies off in a very smooth, straight kind of an arc. You get those long, thin balloons. You might find that it zips around the room in a crazy way. <clears throat> you might find that it just goes bang. But in each of those cases, it's the energy inside the balloon coming out. It's either coming out in a very orderly way, or a very chaotic way, or a very sudden way. You could make a little hole in it, it would come out in a very slow way. But if you get a balloon and you don't blow it up and you let it go, it won't do any of those things. You literally put the energy in and then the energy comes out. And that's what we confuse with the future constantly arriving. What we're only ever seeing is energy being released. Um, there was an extra point to make about that. When you get a balloon, you stick a pin in it and it goes bang. The interesting thing to realise is that that bang is in there. You put it in there. You get two balloons, you get one of them, you don't blow it up. You get the other one, you blow it up. You stick a pin in the one that you haven't blown up, you won't get a bang. You'll always get a bang from the one that you blew up. So you put the bang in there and the bang is sitting in there until you put the pin in it. And it's just waiting there. It's just not allowed to go bang. It's quite odd, but it's the way it is. <laughs> Have you thought about that a lot? <laughs> but I'd mention that I'm single. <laughs> How long was your bath? <laughs> In time. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that particular was probably about yeah. five or six hours. Uh, uh, in all seriousness, I, I was going to write a book called Bathology, <laughs> which is the science of having a long bath. There's a number of things you do. Why don't you get a towel and you put it over your knees if you need stick out because that's a terrible thing to have to do with these. <laughs> the others you get a piece of plastic. Exactly. Yeah. You get a glass with orange juice in it and you put that in the freezer 
you set a timer for an hour and that will be perfectly just crystallised ice when you come out, very refreshing. You get the shower head, you leave that in the bath so that you can top it up without having lots of gurgling noises. Oh, whatever, he's on that one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Foam keeps the heat. You get a bit of plastic and you put it over the overflow with a rubber band and that will give you an extra two inches of depth. Because you're like me, yeah, long and skinny, yeah? Blue tag. Blue tag, you know, anyway. So, and yeah, and that was... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that I had a lot. I went through a book. period of having a lot of long bars. I also had a period where I slept a lot and I had dreams within dreams within dreams and I'm not entirely sure that this isn't one of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the future. We'll move on because we, we, we're running slow. We're behind time. <laughs> uh, break time. We've just had the break. Sorry, folks. Part two. Um, bridging the past, present, and the future. I'm going to just pace it up a little bit, but that'll be fine. Well, we can see the past, but not the future. Aging and the temporal order of events. I read a lot of books, and they about time. And every time I read something that's very tricky, a book about time will say something at the very beginning about why it's obvious time exists. They talk about the order of events, and that's a very tricky thing to untangle. This is a thought experiment that I came up with. Einstein started this whole thought experiment idea. You, he just asks you to imagine a situation. And it's, it's a very good thing to do because you don't have to worry about all the, the complexities, the, the mundane complexities like Gareth was doing with the fox and the chicken thing. You just focus on the problem. Here's my, my question. You get three students. You give them a design for a bridge and you send them each in a separate room with some instructions. At the end, one of them comes out and says, I've worked out why that bridge collapsed 100 years ago. It's because there's a design flaw here. It got struck missing. <clears throat> the other one comes out and says, you shouldn't build this bridge because it will collapse. There's a design flaw. The other one comes out and says, you've got to phone them up now and stop them using that bridge. There's a design flaw. So they each think different things. One of them thinks that he's thinking about the past. One of them thinks that she's thinking about the future. One of them thinks that he's thinking about the present. But all that they've, both, they've all done is they've gone into a room with some A4 paper with squiggles on it and a model of a bridge, and then they've done some thinking. And that's quite bizarre. You know, they seem to think they're thinking about the future, seem to think they're thinking about the past. They're all doing the same thing, they're all just thinking, but they framed it in a certain way. Why well, we can see the past and not the future. If you're on a ferry and you're going to Calais from Dover, you have lunch in Dover and then you get on the ferry and you, you wait to have you know, whatever you have evening meal in, in Calais. And then we think, oh, it was a very pleasant lunch back there in Though, but that's all over, that's behind us, you know, it's in the past. I wonder what Calais will be like. And what actually happens when you're in this boat is that the things behind you are still going on. They just become less and less important and significant to you. And the things ahead of you are becoming more and more important and will affect you more. If there's a loud disco going on in Calais as you approach, you know, your future will seem to get louder. But it's just going on. It's all just going on now. And, and when you look at physical relationships and things, you know, literally our future is what is physically ahead of us. And one of the things with time is it seems to constantly flow forwards, but if you think about it, everything goes forwards. You know, if I get this, this stick and I move it in a random direction, if you all watch carefully, you'll see that it moves forwards. You know, when things move, we call it forwards. If I want to get a drink, I walk forwards to the cash till, I put my card in forwards, I press the buttons forwards, some information comes out on the screen forwards, some notes come out forwards, I put them forwards into my pocket, I take them out forwards, I give them to the bartender forwards, the drink comes out forwards into the glass, I get forwards into my throat, forwards out my dick, and I go forwards home. <laughs> All motion becomes forwards. If a car reverses into a tree and a squirrel is looking at it, that squirrel will just see the car going forwards. We shouldn't get tied up whether the end is pointy or not. <laughs> direction is going. Yeah. And that's one of the things that people go, you know, well, time constantly travels forwards. You know, it, 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 things just move. You've had it this way. Anyway. One of the books I read, it said, you know, we can see the past but not the future. And this is the beginning reason for assuming that time exists. It's a critical thing. It's very true. Oh, yeah, we can't see the, the future. We can see the past. It's a clear reason for suspecting that they, they really exist. In reality, this, this is a little cartoon I did ages ago. This scientist has got a, a monster and he's going to attack his, his nemesis here because he's built this monster. What he doesn't realise is that the nemesis has built a bigger monster. So he's going to beat his monster up when he gets around the corner. But of course he can't see this because it's around the corner. And the point is this. When we think we're thinking about the past, 
what we're really doing is we're looking inside of the contents of our heads. When we're wondering about what's happening in the future, we're really wondering about what's happening around the, the corner. You know, we cannot see round corners, but we can see inside our heads. And that's why we get confused with the idea of the future and the past. If things could just change, that would explain how we can imagine a future. Does that make sense? No, it's not good enough proof. Again. <laughs> if no. We're looking for a proof that the future exists. Oh, oh hang on. <laughs> Look, it's come now. Uh, but isn't that very ego-centered? Uh, well, it's all about, you know, what you can see in your head. <laughs> You know, it's like there's nothing that exists apart from what you think exists or what you can see. No, no, what, no. It, that's what you're saying, isn't it? No, 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 hold on, hold on. No, what I'm what saying about is... about something outside of that that just exists that without you? It's an interesting... Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I'm saying everything exists. It's an interesting kind of mind uh, experiment you can do. If you have two people in a room and the room's sealed, mm. <clears throat> I would say that there's nothing they can talk about that isn't in that room. They can only talk about things that are in that room. So they might talk about the, the green shield stamp sign on the table or whatever, whatever, their clothes. <clears throat> but if you try and talk to me about something that isn't in this room, you will only actually be talking about something that's in your mind. So if I talk to you about the moon, I'm really talking about a memory that I just had of the moon. The moon also exists, but I'm confusing the map and the territory. Don't worry, it's, it's a conversation. Well, not there. necessarily. <coughs> you can't make it in life like that, can you? When I well, your friends, for God's sake, I mean, they exist outside this room. They all have their minds. <laughs> so, look, here's another thing. No child can be older than his own parent. I'm just trying to show you some things that seem to be cast iron mm. evidence mm. and how they can be undermined. And surely right. if you can give me 15 bits of evidence and I can undermine every single one, you're going to start thinking there's something to it. And Vinny, you've got to ask that question, what if things can just exist and move. If you don't ask the question... I do. Okay. I ask every day. Good. No child can be older than his own parents. First time John group and very good expert in time. And this is at the very beginning of the book, and this is why he's saying that this book's all about time. Here's the reason time exists now. Let's get on and discuss it. All right? And it seems very obvious. No child can be older than their parents. Would you agree? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's the most about any of it. No, no, I don't no, think so. I know, that's fine. No, I, I don't know. think so. I get that a lot. I'm very used to it. <laughs> Here's a, here's so go back, Matt. How, where did you go? What was that about the child and the parents? <laughs> no child oh, right. can, be, can older. be older. And this right. kind of proves that there's a thing called time that it steadily progresses. Right, yeah. you know, you, you're born, you get mm. older, then yeah. the child's born, the child's going to be younger than you. Right, yeah. So people are older and younger. I'm going to try and show you how people are not older or younger than each other. Unless child. it's right. Doctor Who. Again, that would be a tangent. That would, uh, <laughs> yeah. You can see how hard this conversation is anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this is what I'm saying. Yeah, when I'm, I'm saying if you look at Doctor Who, no, that's all completely infe unfeasible. There's no such thing as time travel. And you can check that if you watch, because they always go to Wales uh, in the present. <laughs> so, <laughs> no child can be older than his parent. I mean, they're going to try and disprove that. Right, go for it seems it. very hard to disprove. Yeah, well, the child is the father of the man. That's what works. Uh, uh, no, it never, the child is the father of a man. Depends if the parents are alive. Uh, okay, well, let's move on. With, uh, maybe the, the child is father of the man. How many people do you think I it? can disprove that? I've learned yes. how to get these. Do you think I can? Is that what? I think I can. Yeah. Words yeah. Words. What does it say? The child is father of the man. Well, in, in the, the child, what happens when you're in a child shapes what you're... What are you going to be like? That says your whole theory. What Thanks, Billy. I'll open with that. I'm going to save a couple of hours. So here we go. No child can be his own parent. This is the reason this book is meant to be incredible. It's a good book. It explains a lot of things. Uh, so here's a picture of a parent and his younger child. <laughs> and son. It's a funny thing, you type in whatever, and that's what you come up with. It's like quite amazing. <laughs> so we look at him, we would dispute that you know, he's older than him. A horse. <laughs> <It's so> <laughs> and here's the thing, and what I need you to do is remember those, that, that, that slide of the different traps that we have. You know, if one mountaineer is pulling the other down the mountain, it doesn't work. If you listen to advice that you don't follow, it doesn't work. If you overcomplicate the analogy, it doesn't work. You know, it's, you know, if you don't want to get it, you won't get it, it doesn't matter. So we look at this. Got a beach. We pick out some buckets of water from this beach. Pick out three buckets of water. <clears throat> so the question is three random buckets of water from the beach. Which sample of water is the oldest? Do you reckon it's sample B from the kind of northwest? Do you reckon it's sample C from the east? Do you reckon it's sample A from the south? 
Which sea. sea, you think really it's really all sea water. <laughs> 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 so you would say that the, uh, <laughs> you'd say that the water here is older. No, it's it's more stagnant. Stagnant. You just I'm just playing the game. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> so let's let's. I'll, I'll I'll drive the conversation a little bit. Let's say it's a kind of silly question because it's all seawater and it all gets mixed up together constantly. So it's kind of ridiculous to assume that any particular sample would be older than another. Mm. That would seem to make sense. All right. Now, which of these samples of water, again, pretty much at random, do you reckon is older than the other? Do you reckon this wave is younger than that wave? or this wave is in between the two. Can you see we're still looking at water? We're still looking at random samples of water. But some people would say that this is quite an old wave that's now about to fall apart because it's, it started here, it's traveled down here, probably took it 30 seconds. It's now 30 seconds, years, 30 seconds old and it's, it's going to die. This wave might have only been alive for 10 seconds. It's going to fall for 10 seconds and it's heading towards the beach. So it's a tricky question. Because at best, all matter is basically the same age. It's doing different stuff. And as it does different stuff, we look at it in different ways. But the idea that this stage is older or younger than this bit of plastic is very odd. Because everything is 13.75 billion years old at best. And everything's getting old uh, at the same rate. So matter comes into formations. It, it, it becomes functional. You, know, you could compare these to a couple of computers. One was turned on, one wasn't turned on, whatever. It's incredible what life does. You know, at, at the moment now, you know, life is, is coming into your baby. It's an astonishing thing. If you had, if you had a, a, a spaceship or a boat going on a very long journey with a couple on board and a load of food, there's two people on that boat, and then they make love. And then there's three people, and you kind of go, well, where did this third person come from? And it's quite bizarre. You know, the spark of life has been passed on. But that doesn't prove that there's a past, and it doesn't prove that there's a future. It proves that things can exist and move and change and interact. But when we look at it, we think this is a proof that time exists and passes. We think that this is older than that. We think that this is older than that. But it's a ridiculous thing to say, in my opinion. Because if it's all the same, then... You were going to prove that the child can be older than the parent. No, no, no it's all the same. It's just it's, the same. That, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just that it's just that things can move and change and interact. So all, everything in this room is the same age. Mm. Some it's not doing much. I I got a picture I didn't put on here of a guy. It was like one of the oldest rocks they'd ever found, and it's like four billion years old. This guy, this rock, it's four billion years old. Let's go. See, what do you mean? What was what, what happened then? It just appeared four billion years ago and started becoming older. <laughs> we said nothing around. You know, when did it start being four billion years old? You know, what, what, what is pink? And then there was nothing else there. Do you mean it cooled down four billion years old, ago? But even then there's no other record. It is mysterious, but okay, here we go. So you're just saying that time is infinite then? No, what I'm saying is that what do you mean by time? What are you on about? What I'm saying is, I seem to observe. Well, you're to me now whether it's finite or infinite, really. That's the point, man. Eh? But here's the thing, and I said this at the start. We ask this question what if things could just, and by just I mean only, they just exist and they can move? And what I'm trying to show you is that if things can just exist and move, that explains everything we see around us. Now, if you want to add an extra word to that, yeah, well, it's the same thing, though. So no, it's not the same thing, because... It's when just when basically that matters... But finite, well, it's time is infinite, so eventually all matter will... Change into... Change it's all changing constantly, constantly but I'm well, saying... Eventually reproduce the same... Entirely the same experience yeah. that it already experienced. So what I'm saying is that the, the head professor at Cambridge University uh, and Albert Einstein and Galileo and Newton all disagree with you. They don't think that things existing and moving is the same. They think time exists and that it flows. Hawking says in that video that maybe you could fire a bullet back in time. He doesn't say you could fire... I don't know, back. he believes there is a, there's a point of creation. That's why the Catholic Church gave him loads of money now. Oh, is it? <laughs> maybe I should start believing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. but hang on a sec. Well, the old father and the, the child thing. Yeah. Because you're, you're just saying that they're the same age because what well, they exist now. Because that's, you, you just don't want to admit that old what's-his-face stepped over 
was alive and kicking in 1930 or something or whatever, and his son, Harry H. Corbett, came along in 1950. I mean, yes, they're both in the picture at the same time. Yeah. But that doesn't mean anything. No, what I'm saying is that, what I'm saying is that, I must get this rolled the wrong way. What I'm saying is that this collection of matter and that collection of matter yeah. and this collection of matter and this collection here and yeah. this collection here mm. is all just matter and it's all constantly doing something. Mm. And if it can just exist and move and change and interact, it mm. could, some of it could end up looking like this and some could end up looking like that mm. at the same time. When this stuff looked hit here looked like a baby, <laughs> all of this stuff here was doing something somewhere, but we just didn't call it Ronnie Corbett, where his name is. We wouldn't bother. Harry <laughs> Corbett. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm saying is, as humans, you know, right. when we look up and we see a cloud in the sky, we look at the cloud, but we don't look at the equal number of atoms over here because we're just not bothered. You know, it's a very biased view. I'm just saying, if stuff could just exist and change and interact, could we end up with this situation? The answer is yes. This seems to be a proof that time exists and passes and changes. If we got this guy mm. when he was just born yeah. and we froze him, yeah. you could end up in a situation where this lot of stuff looked younger than that lot of stuff, mm. yeah. only because it stopped doing something. Yeah. yeah. So I'm saying the inroad, the only inroad, if you start off asking if time exists, all of the evidence will seem to confirm it. But if you don't pollute your, your, your view and you just ask, what do I see? Well, I see things existing. What else do I see? I see them moving and interacting. Do I need anything else to explain what I see? If you want to say to me, Matt, I've had this idea. I think there's another thing called time that flows through everything in a mysterious dimension. I'd, I'd say, okay, I'm willing to listen to you, Vinny. I'll teach you how to do power. Why don't you do your own fucking presentation? <laughs> <laughs> Try not to swear, swear, swear. <laughs> so, so, not in front of the child. Right? So, <laughs> very good. Space time, pre relatively <laughs> physics. Yeah, if you guys get in the just let me know. I feel like I've earned my money so far. So, <laughs> <laughs> theory of relativity is intimately connected with the theory of space and time. It doesn't say space and things just existing and moving. It's obvious there's nothing else. They use this word time. This is Einstein's own words translated. I shall therefore begin with a brief investigation of the origin of our ideas of space and time. Single events which we remember appear to be ordered according to, this is me pointing in the wrong way, the cr criterion of earlier and later, which cannot be analysed further. So you might say that you got up and then you brushed your teeth and should we turn this off? How do I turn that off? Why isn't it off? It should be thing that says high pointer screen, blank screen, point options. Am I, am I missing it? Oh, arrow options. Hidden. Thank you. Only my second presentation. <coughs> Single events which we remember appear to be ordered according to criteria of earlier and later, which cannot be analysed further. So you wake up, then you brush your teeth, then you have breakfast. You very rarely have breakfast then wake up and then brush your teeth, or brush your teeth and then wake up. We seem to do things in an order. <coughs> the order which we remember, it's quite an important word. It seems to be ordered, blah, 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 blah. Now here's a, this is a, my, a thought experiment. And again, if you want to grab the rope and pull me down the hill, you're more than welcome, but it might be worth relaxing and seeing what I'm trying to say. You go to a video, uh, football game and you're videoing it, and you end up with these frames on your camera of the action and they're very good proof that this guy lined up a shot, he took the shot, it was close and it went in. You could go to a magazine, you could sell these pictures to someone and they would buy them. Oh, that's great, he's just lining up the shot, brilliant, wow, the whole sequence, that's great. And if there is a recorded sequence, then there is a recorded sequence and you could take it to a shop and you could sell it. So we can agree at least that if there is a recorded sequence, there is a recorded sequence. Can we agree on that? It's an yeah. important point. <coughs> What if the camera had a weird fault? And all it ever did was it, it displayed what was happening, but it never recorded it, just like a camera that's, that's on without record being pressed or whatever. Then it wouldn't record that sequence. So you watch the match, you line up the camera, but it's only ever constantly recording that one frame and then deleting it and recording the next one, deleting it. And you go to the magazine, you say, it was this great shot. You've got to buy the picture. The way you lined it up was brilliant. They go, great, can I buy the picture? And you go, yeah, you can buy it. He goes, where is it? He goes, well, it doesn't exist. 
but you've got to see it. Well, I can't see it because it doesn't exist. Yeah, but it did happen. I know, I believe you, but where's the record? If there isn't a recorded sequence, then there isn't a recorded sequence. So can anyone disagree with that? If there is a recorded sequence, there is. If there isn't, there isn't. Okay. In the real world, in the world that we live in now, as we're walking around it, if there is a sequence created and recorded in time, then there is a sequence. And it's got a flow, it's got a direction. These things happen in order. I'm not denying that things happen and that they have happened. And if there is a recorded sequence, that's great, because we, we can have a direction, and we can have an order. But if there isn't a sequence that's created and recorded, then there isn't. Now, you have to, at this point, just ask that question. You, you might think, oh, but there is. You know, I'm not asking you whether you think there is one, I'm asking to consider. If there isn't a sequence, then there isn't a sequence. We agreed that when we looked at the film. And if there isn't a sequence, then there is just the present in which things move and change, which is what we constantly observe. That's what we see. And this is the moment where you kind of step out and you go, yeah, but I'm convinced there's a past. You go, yeah, I know, you're looking at the contents of your head, and it makes sense, and I agree that it makes sense, and it's very useful. I, I use it myself, I always will use it. <laughs> But I'm saying, is there a past that's created? And if there isn't, there isn't. If there is, there is. But if there isn't, then there's no direction. And there's no sequence. And there's no order. It's not actually created. And I'm asking you now to think, is it created or not created? If it's not created, it's not created. If there isn't a sequence created and recorded, then there isn't a past. We've got the idea of one, and that's great, I'll use it. But it isn't really there. We've got the idea of money, and that's great, I'll use it. But it doesn't really exist. <clears throat> There's no reason to then suspect that a future exists. We just see things moving and changing in the past. There's no direction or order. There's no flow of a thing called time. The only flow happens when you put petrol in your car and it flows to the engine and the car flows down the road. Things happen all over the world, but only if they've got energy within them, not because there's also another thing called time. There's only the constantly changing present. You have to consider that possibility. What if things just exist and change? And it's a very weird thought, because if they just exist and change, you, you start thinking, you just think, that's really weird. That's, that means that it's always only ever just been now. There's a guy called Alan Watts, a uh, philosopher. He's there now, but he said, um, imagine when you die that you fall into a sleep that you never wake up from. It's a very hard thing to imagine. But imagine waking up from a sleep that you never went into. That seems harder to imagine but it is what you've done. And it's a very odd thought, because we've all just kind of woken up from a sleep that we never went into. You go, sorry, what's all this about again? How much do I owe? <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember signing anything. Now, how, sorry, how do you plan? I mean, if everything just happens and changes and moves, how do you plan anything? I mean, you, in order to plan anything, you've got to predict in some sense yeah, sure. how things happen. My plans, when I look in this room, I, I, I don't worry about this wall at all much because it doesn't seem to be moving much and seem to have much of a, I don't have to think about it much, there's not much going on there. Um, and if there was a kid running around there with a chainsaw, I'd probably think about that kid a lot. So I, I, this is what I'm kind of saying, if things move a lot, you've got to think a lot about them, but if they don't move a lot, you know, they don't move a lot. You've got to look at things that are moving and deal with them. As humans, we're like a car that's always running. We can't stop this car. If we stop it, it'll never start again. Our bodies are like a, an engine that's always running. So we're always ticking over. We're always wearing out. And we call that aging. And you know, the buses, you're, you're the buses and the tubes, and we will have to stop at a certain point. But only because people like us will be looking at little pointers and going, oh, Joe, when that gets there, I'm going to have to not do this anymore. Go, Joe, you could if you really wanted to, mate. It's, this is honestly just a bit of plastic. You know? That's all it is. So you look at, I don't know, what things change. I mean, I'll have to eat because I'm constantly moving and I'm constantly radiating heat and my reserves are going down. Yeah, and I'll have to wee when pressure builds up too much. But it'll never be to do with a thing all time. It'll only be what's actually happening. So, I mean, if you're playing football and the ball's curving through there, you do a lot of maths. You work out how it's moving and that lets you build a model of that ball in your head and work out that you've got to be here. But that doesn't prove there's a future. I don't know if that makes sense. But. How do you feel about being on time? Does um, it really matter? Well, I did a gig uh, in Halifax. It's funny, before I started on this stuff, and we were late because of the traffic. 
Yeah. Um, an hour late, apparently, and uh, went to start at eight, to start at nine, and we got there, and I finally got on stage, ran of course, whatever. And I said, look, I just want to say, I'm really sorry that we didn't start on time. I said, we were going to start on time. I said, we, we could have started on time, but we were so far away that you wouldn't have heard anything. Yeah. And it's always distance. If you ever miss a train, it'll always be distance. You know when people say, you yeah, know, when's the next bus? It's here, it exists, it's probably behind Wood Green. You know when you at the bus station you see those things, next bus five minutes, I wish they'd stop doing that because all you know is it's definitely not five minutes. Mm. That's all you ever know. If they said one and a half miles, you go, oh God, it'll be stuck at Wood Green by the <laughs> <laughs> bridge. That's what you would know and that would be the truth. Yeah, that's, what, that's the truth, it's how far away it is. You, know, you tell us the distance and the speed it's traveling, and I go, oh, I'll wear that up myself. <laughs> We'll show you put these. Any other questions? We got loads of stuff to move on, so it'll come to you. It'll be more whatever. Oh. Um, now we're getting to the complicated stuff. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll, we'll brush over this, it'll be fine. Uh, universal relative time, genuine time travel, black hole communications, nearly home time. Oh. And if anyone's got to go, just let me know. It's now 10 to 11, so I know we've all got buses and trains to catch or whatever. So. Okay. Newton thought that time was a rigid thing. He thought that if you had a clock, uh, you set it at midday and you set all the clocks in the universe at midday, it would always be midday everywhere. Einstein said it was very different. Einstein said if you set a load of clocks on this grid all to 12 o'clock and you ran them all off, it would be agreed that they were all just ticking constantly. The problem is, if you went in a jet plane very quickly from here to here or a spaceship, you set your clock at 12 o'clock, all the clocks are saying 12 o'clock, all, they all start ticking together. Your clock would be synchronized with all the other clocks. But if you zipped over there at great speed, while you were zipping at great speed, your clock would become slow. And when you reach that far, far corner, it might say one o'clock, and your clock might just say quarter to one. This is time dilation, this is the slowing down of time. Newton thought the opposite, he thought it would always be the same time everywhere, but then he lived in an era where we didn't have these incredible machines and I'm not even sure what Einstein's insight was that, that led him to make this complete one. I do know what it was, but it's, 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 it's called the equivalence principle. <coughs> Galileo said, if you're on a boat going down a canal, and you've got a candle, and there's water dripping from the boat, sealing down, and there's moss flying around, you can't tell that you're moving unless you look out the window, if it's a very smooth canal. And right now, we're doing something like 63,000 miles an hour as we spin around the Earth because we've got a long way to go, we've got 600 million miles to go to get back here, you know. So we're moving at great speed, but we can't tell. And this is what all of relativity stems from, it's obvious. Which one's right? There's only way to find out. Fight! <laughs> <laughs> this is just a bit of Photoshop fun. Yeah, it took ages to get his hair to hang down behind that arm and whatever, whatever. <laughs> so, this is a, the, the reason I'm saying this is because the question seems to be, was Einstein right that time is kind of squishy, bendy thing? Or was Newton right that time is rigid? And every scientist will agree that Newton was definitely wrong. They don't mean to insult him, it's just that he couldn't have worked out. He did a great deal of work, integration, differentiation throughout the nation. But in seeing that Einstein had got something critical correct, we just also swallow the pill, ah, oh, therefore time exists, let's move on. And I'm saying what he noticed was that machines would run more slowly as you move them. He didn't prove that there was a future, he didn't prove there was a past, he didn't prove the time flow between them. He assumed it at the beginning. <coughs> he assumed it because he assumed there was a temporal order to events, which I hope I've undermined. Hope you all sleep well. Okay, so in my opinion, neither of them are correct. The way things change is a bit squishy and wishy. Um, I'm using the old version of the slides, I can't believe that. These two machines have got similar performance because they're similar, they're built in a similar way to similar specifications and they're made out of similar stuff and they're moving on a planet that's identical and so follow the same laws of principle of physics. <coughs> These two machines remain in synchronization for the same reason. They're just machines that will run at a certain rate, they've got an amount of energy coming through them, they're made by the same company the parts are machined in the same way. If you pour some sand into this one, it will start lagging behind that one because you'll change it. But it's not because they're both tracking another thing called time. They're both, both just doing what they're doing and that's why they remain aligned. Einstein said that time is that which clocks measure. Very famous quote. And I hate it because it's, it's very... 
I don't know, it's like beating someone up and going, that's what I do. <laughs> it's not really a very convincing proof of anything. But so, And he said that moving clocks run slow. This is a principle of relativity. It's true, it's been confirmed. But the question is what you think these things are. Because I think these things are just motors. And every one of them has got a power source, some weights that hang down, a spring that releases. You'll have to put the energy here in by turning a spring. You'll have to put the energy in here by lifting a weight. You'll have to put the energy in here by nipping down the corner shot. So what clocks measure is the flow or release of energy. And you have to start off by, by kind of thinking, is it true that clocks demonstrate or measure the flow or release of energy? And you'd have to say, well, yeah, they do. If you take the battery out, that's going to stop. If you let that run down, it's going to stop. You get rid of the weights out, stop. So you start saying, well, this first thing is correct. Yes, they, yeah, they do. They definitely measure the flow and release of energy. But the next question is, do they measure this extra thing, this extra thing called time? And what he's saying here is time is that which clocks measure. You go, well, hold on, if time exists, then I would agree with you, they measure it. But that's not a proof. That's all just a proof that energy flows out of a thing. That's all I can say. I said I didn't prove there was a past and a future and a flow of time between them. He just assumed it. Uh, this is your, your relativity thing. If you get a clock in a moving object, it has to be moving very fast, it has to be moving at half the speed of light for this to be noticeable. Light is incredibly fast. It's 186,000 miles a second, which is just minorly fast, not even 186,000 miles an hour. So if you have a clock on the ground, you have a clock in a moving rocket, this one will change more slowly. But even this doesn't prove that there's a future and a past. It just proves that things will change more slowly in the present. But if we've got this whole time thing in our heads, we'll see this difference. Oh yeah, they measure time. This one's different from that one. That means there's something special about time. You see how we, we jump to these conclusions. We kind of go with this flow, again, in my opinion. This is why moving clocks run slow. This is called a light clock. It's a kind of thought experiment by Einstein. Brilliant, brilliant idea. What he's saying is you get two mirrors and you bounce light between them. The one thing we, we know and we can observe is that light always travels at the same speed. So this light bounces up and down, we have a little counter on the top, this becomes the simplest clock in the world and the most accurate clock in the world. The problem is if you move this clock from left to right, your light can still only travel at its maximum speed, but now it's got further to go. You've used up some of its motion, you can't just grab it and move it, you, the light will always travel at the same speed. So this moving clock will tick less, this one will tick about four times, that one will tick about three times. It's, it's, a, it's been observed and it's kind of, you know, it's how GPS works, with that word. One way of considering it is this. You've got a hand going around a dial. And the maximum speed this hand can ever move would be the speed of light. If you try to also move that clock, you're trying to force that tip to move at the speed of light and a bit. And what I'm trying to show here is that we think that you have local change, a change in time, and we think you can change your location, your position, but really it's just change. It's just this thing's going round, or it's going along, or it's going round and going along. But the idea that this thing measures time and this thing's moving, they're just things that are moving. This is, I always get his name on, Valery Palyuk, or whatever, Russian guy. He's been in space and he holds the record for being in space the longest. And he is, in theory, and people would say this, this is a quoted example, he's, he's a real time traveler because he's younger than he should be. Because he has been flying through space at 20,000 miles an hour for 400 days, his clocks, all of his clocks, his hair, his, his nails, his body, everything about him would have changed more slowly. So in theory, and any clocks he has on the spaceship, he will genuinely be you know, a couple of minutes of a year younger. Doesn't seem to matter. But all you do is you exaggerate that. You say, all right, I can't handle a couple of minutes of a, a, a second. That doesn't make sense to me. So let's exaggerate it and say it's six months. He, he does this effect. So that it becomes a very significant amount of time, six months of time. Now that would seem to really tangibly prove that time and time travel happens and exists and that you know, we can manipulate it or we can travel through it. Because if we, if we stayed up long enough, and it, or we made it move fast enough, this could literally happen. Here he comes down, and the ground crew say, 
happy 53rd birthday, Val, because according to their clocks and calendars on the ground, he's now 53. I mean, vastly exaggerating the actual effect, that doesn't matter. But he says, but no, I'm only 52 and a half. <laughs> so, so the ground crew, and they look at his clocks, and it's confirmed, he seems to have traveled six months into the future. And he seems to have come out of the past and traveled into the future. And from his point of view, he seems to have traveled into the future. And this seems very convincing proof that time and time travel and time dilation, all of this stuff makes sense. Can I get out of it? That's the question. And I'm saying there's no time travel into the future. There's a different rates of change. And don't forget, if there's time travel into the future or into the past, then we can start asking people for lottery numbers. Or we can ask them to go back and remind me to take my keys with me when I left on Tuesday morning because I left without them and it would be really handy. This is the thing, you know, with lottery numbers, be worth a fortune, you know, this is, this is the mind stretching stuff. But I'm saying, no, if you look at it very carefully, there was no time travel in the future, it was just different rates of change. He changes more slowly if he's moving quickly. Val didn't travel into the future, he changed more slowly than the ground crew. So imagine this, this is not a time machine, this is a rate machine. Anything within this box changes at a slower rate. Anything on the Mir space station would change at a slower rate. It's, it's a confirmed fact. It's only a tiny amount, but it's still changing at a slower rate. Anything outside the box changes at a normal rate. But the point is that you can still play table tennis with the bloke on the inside. All right? Because from his point of view, he's, he's moving Everything looks fine. The thing with relativity, everything looks fine where you are. So from the outside guy looking in the box, the bloke inside seems to be moving more slowly. He reads more slowly. His clock moves more slowly. He decides to play a game of table tennis with you. He picks up the bat. It's moving more slowly. You think, great, I've got a great advantage. But as the ball bounces out and through there, it speeds up to your time, your rate of change. So you whack this ball back in. Now, from his point of view on the inside, looking out, everything seems to be moving a bit more quickly. So again, we seem to have kind of a, a, a discrepancy or whatever. But that could go on forever. No one ever slips into the past. No one ever travels into the future. Just one person moves more slowly than the other and changes more slowly. One person moves, changes more quickly than, than the other. And it's all just here now. And that kind of disproves that time exists and flows and that there's a past and future and that we can travel through time. This would all work. I mean, it's bizarre, you can never do that. You, you have to be traveling fast or, or near a big gravity object, whatever. Time confusions. When we look at the stars, we think we're seeing the past. This is something that you will classically hear about. That star, the star that made this light no longer exists. And this is kind of true. You know, we look up and we see the starlight and some of those stars really don't exists, but then I'm in the park and I hear a dog bark, and sometimes I hear a bark even though the dog stopped barking. Because the bark has just had to fly through the air and reach my ears. When we look at the stars, we say we're seeing them as they were in the temporal past. This again is kind of meant to be a proof of the past. <clears throat> but now consider this guy. He thinks he's seeing starlight from the past. Fuck, I'm feeling the past. If you get whacked <laughs> by a tennis ball, you know, oh my God! I just felt something from four seconds in the past. <laughs> <laughs> you're feeling what you feel. You know, photons exist, they fly through the air, they hit your eye, and they hit you in the back of the eye, and that's what you're seeing. You're seeing it here, and you're seeing it now, and it's doing what it's doing. It, it's true that it, it's mysterious how it all changes. I'll, I'll clarify that. But that's a kind of a confusion. Again, if you assume time exists, you're, that's how you will analyze what you see. You're really just seeing starlight. It, what you're seeing is a wave of light hitting you. You refocus it to a point, and you call this point back here uh, the starlight. Uh, you call that the star. It's not. It's a load of light that you've refocused into a point. I know it came from a star, but whatever. The Hubble Deep Field image. They got the Hubble telescope up in space and they left the, the lens open for something like a, a million seconds. <clears throat> and it created this incredible image. Some of these are galaxies that are just billions and billions of years old, so to speak. Just, it gave us so much information, it's an amazing thing. But this is my interpretation of it. If they left the lens open here for an hour, one hour is 3,600 seconds, light travels at 300,000 kilometers a second, a third of a million kilometers a second. Basically, they let in over a billion, uh, 
get this right, a thousand million kilometers of light. That's what they let in. When they started this picture off and they opened that thing up, there already was a load of photons heading in this way. It was a thousand million kilometers of photons heading towards that thing. They existed, they were there. They were heading towards this thing. And all this thing did was capture them as they flew into it. It doesn't prove there's a past, it doesn't prove there's a future, it doesn't prove that time needs to travel and whatever, whatever. What you're seeing here is really all the photons that are in that bit of space that are flying towards you. And it's interesting where they came from, it's fascinating, but we shouldn't misinterpret what we see. Another way of looking at it <coughs> is to consider this picture. And you want to look at this here, and I would say, is there anyone here who trying to word my question so that you don't have to answer positively. Because <laughs> I know what you like. Um, you look at this, a raindrop seems to have hit that puddle where you can all deduce that. Although we can't see the raindrop, we can see all this evidence of it. So surely we're just seeing or feeling what is here now. Apparently that star, the star that made this light no longer exists. Wow, apparently the raindrop that made this ripple no longer exists. <laughs> Yeah, things happen, they have consequences. What's really happened here, assume that star is dead, is that the star has just become a ball of light that's flying out. It just changed. You know, we're not talking about that. it just changed. And here, the water hit that, it creates a ripple. And what I'm trying to show here is that all of history, this is the history of that raindrop. The raindrop hits the water, it creates a history, but the history disperses out into all the water and as it disperses it's called upon to do different things so it degrades it flies away it just spreads out it gets thinner eventually there'll be no trace of it they say a buddhist monk will walk down the street and he's amazed at the buildings that he sees but he's equally amazed because he knows that one day there'll be no trace of them that's a phenomenal thought that one day there'll be no trace of london at all because it's constantly changing so i'm trying to say that all of history all of the records of World War II, all of the records of you coming out of the train station is all just here now and it's changing. Some of it's very stable, some of it's very unstable. And that gives us the impression that there's a, a thing called time. When this people passes him, he thinks that it's all over. Oh, that event's over. When we're at a rock concert and the drum is banging away on the drums, you might do some kind of a drum fill and we'll hear it and then we think it's over, but the blokes at the back of the crowd, they haven't heard it yet. You know, they could even be a situation where there's a bolt of lightning and one person will think that the bolt of lightning occurred before the drum soda and the other will think that it occurred midway through it, depending on where you are. Messages fly around and travel, whatever. History is raindrops and ripples. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. All those moments will be lost in time, like tears in the rain. Nora Batty from me. His name's actually Roy Batty, I didn't know that, but that's his thing. And what I'm saying is that all those moments will be lost, but they will be lost literally like tears in the rain. You know, those moments are recorded in his head, but his head's going to dissolve and disintegrate. You know, we, we go through our lives accumulating all this knowledge, but when we die, it all disperses. We just don't get to chat to people while it's dispersing like we do. It's called Alzheimer's. But, but that's what I'm saying. So things happen, but as they happen, they have effects, and this is the history. This is what you know, the Magna Carta was signed. You know, Battle of Hastings happened. We can buy a book and we can look at it. But that's all we're doing. We're looking at this thing now, and that thing's falling apart. Uh, near the end. General relativity, black hole time, time dilation. If you have a black hole, all a black hole is, it's not a hole. It's a, just a very massive, solid object that's got a tremendous amount of gravity near it. And it so happens that if you put a clock near a black hole and a clock up here, this clock will run slower than that clock. It's like that rate machine. But what's fascinating is that if you had an explorer ship orbiting close to the black hole and another ship up here, uh, some distance away, they could communicate. And the problem is that if this ship sent a message once a day, this ship would end up getting a message once an hour. And if they radio back and they said, hey, you know, you're sending us too many messages, we agreed, you know, once a day, the reverse would happen. You know, they, they send back a message every hour, they only get it once a day. And this looks again like a genuine kind of proof that, that time and time distortions can happen. But if you imagine just getting a couple of tape recorders and a tape loop and getting some very special squishy tape 
such that when you recorded here, the tape got more and more squished down here. You'd find that you could send messages up that end, and they'd get squished, they'd get delayed. And when these people heard them here, they'd be very scrunched up, and they get compressed. Sorry. So you might send a message every two minutes, but by the time it gets down here, it's only one minute, and it's in the optimized mouse voice. And someone here says there seems to be some kind of a problem, but as it comes up here, it becomes there seems to be some kind of a problem. So what I'm saying is that if things just exist here and now, if you see these messages as real things, as pulses of radio waves that happen to get squished up as they head down here, and again, it's not time that's being stored, it's just objects in space, and it's all happening now. Summary and conclusions. Uh, what does timelessness mean to normal people? Luckily, there aren't any in the room at the moment. Uh, <laughs> like money, time doesn't exist, but it's almost as if it does. And this is why it's a perfect illusion. You know, it's like our eyesight. It really, really feels to me like I can see that thing over there, but I can't. I can only see the back of my eye. It's a perfect illusion. That's why it's so hard to see through. You'll only see it if you, if you think, if you try, whatever. This is a normal person. Kind of. um, it's useful to see things as they are. Yeah, you might look at the world a bit differently, you know, when people are in a rush, you're like, do you know what, it's only because you're rushing that we've all got to rush. Yeah, there actually isn't anything else happening, you know, if there's a storm approaching, there's a storm approaching, you've got to get out of the way of that, whatever, but it's not because time keeps coming. They say in the rat race, you know, win or lose, you're still a rat. <laughs> Less incorrect complexity. This is what I'm saying, Occam's razor says, the simplest solution that answers all of the questions is probably the correct one. And saying that things just exist and move seems to answer a lot of things, and it seems to untangle a lot of things, it seems to explain a lot of paradoxes, whatever. So I sat the, the rat race. What does it mean to science? Uh, what I'm saying to Einstein is there's no space time, there's just space and motion. Yes, things move at a different rate when they're moving, but there's never a future, there's never a past, there's never any discrepancies. Walk in, no, no tra time travel. Just, you can walk space, you can stretch things, you might travel faster than you expected, but you'll never be in the past or the future. Um, any equation with T in it, you've got to see it a bit differently. You've got to realise that you're just comparing the motion of one thing to another. Like I said with the Earth, you're spinning, you're doing that. You're only ever comparing one thing to another. This is a tricky one. This is in, at the moment, they're looking for a grand unified theory, a theory that explains everything. And quantum mechanics is an incredibly bizarre and complicated thing, but it seems to make a lot of sense. But one of the things they say is that when a particle makes a, what's called a quantum leap, it borrows energy from the future. This is what the equations will end up having you believe. It can borrow a little bit of energy as long as it pays it back within a billionth of a second. This is how the equations work. And I'm saying, well, hold on a second, because I haven't seen anything that makes me believe there's a past or a future. I've seen why you've all assumed it, and I've seen how your assumptions can seem to be confirmed. And that's the kind of thing that I'm saying you should look at differently. You know, you talk quantum mechanics, you should look at that differently. I want it to be a quantum mechanic, it's the parts. But my point is that if you had two guys banging on a thin wall from opposite sides with hammers, just at random, just banging at random, you might find that at one moment they both happen to bang at the same spot on the wall, and that would have an odd effect. Someone would go, that's unusual, I didn't expect that. And that's not because the guy borrowed energy from the future, it's because he borrowed energy from what was directly in front of him. And that's what I'm saying, when you look at it, the future will turn out to be whatever is physically in front of you. If you run into that wall, your future will involve getting bruised at the points where you hit that wall, in my opinion. Um, if we get rid of time, you're forced not to use an incorrect escape route. You can't use this excuse. Oh yeah, there's that. It's a tricky point, but I'm trying to say, if you're, if in physics, the history of physics, they thought various things. They thought that that fire was caused by a thing called phlogiston or something that entered into things that were burning. And as long as they had that excuse for about 200 years, they never understood fire. And when you disprove that, you're forced to try and find a better route. Any theory built on times that I mention has to be reframed. I hate the expression that I mention. Uh, things like string theory, they talk about the 11th dimension. I go, whoa, you've called time the fourth one, and I'm not even happy with that. I'm not, you can't just keep building them on unless you show me. Things have aspects, they have speed and velocity and mass, but an aspect isn't that dimension. Working out the universe, you have to do it without time. There's no time travel, you have to give up. There's a guy in America who's spent a fortune on it. So what if it doesn't exist? Well, what if the Earth's round or flat? You know, you could argue that. Who cares? It doesn't make any difference, you know. 
if the world was round and the world was flat, <laughs> I actually nicked that cartoon idea off the Giles. I couldn't find it. it was, I remember seeing it as a kid. It's like, yeah, he's the thing every girl problem. <laughs> um, if you thought the world was flat, you would never conceive that you could create satellites that orbit it. You know, it would limit what you're thinking. You'd go up wrong avenues and you'd have whatever. That's pretty much it. Uh, I've got some other slides you want to see, and that's the book. I'm going to try and bring it out on Kindle. Um, I've just no idea what to do with this project. Uh, I think anyone who's, who's got all the PhDs to understand it will not listen to it beyond the first sentence because it will seem to them to be obviously wrong. Um, but whatever, we'll see. Um, and there are some others you want to see. Um, this, is, um, this, <laughs> <laughs> this is... This is a bit of a mind fuck, so to speak. Uh, it's the order of events. Which came first, the hour of the astronauts? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Obviously, 1066 happened. About Hastings happened, and then they went to the moon. They went to the moon after. But the question is, you know, while Howard was doing whatever he was doing, what were all these atoms doing? And they were doing something somewhere that you wouldn't have noticed. And while this was going up to the moon, what were all those atoms doing? They were doing something somewhere that you wouldn't have noticed because they were all spread out. And if you think about it, everything's all happening at once. Things form into objects, and they disform, and they form, and they disform. While um, Harold was doing his stuff, I think the Chinese were developing the forerunner of the rockets. And while they went to the moon, all the atoms that were in Baton Hastings were still doing something, they just didn't look interesting. That's about it. Just another way of looking at the paradox. Uh, this is space time in force, which are complicated, like another talk. But what, all I'm saying here is, I don't think I should say it, it's, anyone heard of space time intervals? No. Uh, yeah. We'll miss our buses if we go in. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it, Seb. We're finished, mate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Uh, hopefully available on Kindle at some point soon. Uh, there's a website, I should have it up there if you go to uh, mattwelcome.co.uk. Um, and if any